I want to warmly welcome you to the session entitled Tips for Freelancers on how to identify and, and enter premium markets. Um, our first speaker and presenter today is Chris Durban. She's a French to English business translator based in Paris. She has worked both in-house in her first decade and as a freelancer in the next three and a half decades. Chris translates virtually every day for a portfolio of demanding clients, most of them in the private sector, and she enjoys it immensely. She's also an enthusiastic supporter of professional associa associations, including Francis SFT, the Société Française des Traducteurs, where she served on the board, then as president, and in and Britain's ITI Institute of Translation and Interpreting, where she is a fellow. She is a co-founder of SVT Summer School for Financial Translators and co-founder of the Translate In events that promote writing skills for translators. Yeah. Along with Chris, we have uh, David Gemielity with us today. He goes by Dave and he was our keynote speaker at TIFF in 2019. He is the head of the translation team at BCV, the fifth largest bank in Switzerland. He is also a member of the bank's communications committee, which defines the bank's corporate communication policy in, across all languages. As a member of that group, he's been in charge of creating BCV's brand identity since 2015. He also teaches in the translation master's program at the University of Geneva's Faculty of Translation and Interpreting. Dear Chris, dear Dave, thank you very much for joining us. And without further ado, Chris, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, great that you could join us. To linguists who work outside the premium markets, the segments of premium segments of the translation market, premium evokes higher compensation. And I know, I'm aware of that for some people, uh, this idea of being apparently better than other people annoys them. It sounds like you're swaggering and so on. I'll get back to that in a minute. But for now, a point I'll be emphasizing throughout this session, and I'm willing to bet that Dave agrees with me on this, is that it's the other way around. That is, while premium segments exist and generally do pay more, than the non-specialized work, especially the commoditized translation at the bulk end of the market. Uh, it's because the content that you're dealing with in premium markets is acknowledged by the client to be high risk. The budgets are there because of the risk. To quote our US colleague, Kevin Hensel, premium markets are places where the consequences of receiving a poor translation, so a translation fail in effect, are far more serious than the rewards of getting a good one. It's why a drilling rig valve that's installed on the seabed in the Gulf of Mexico uh, costs an awful lot more than a valve that you would buy for your garden hose at a local gardening store. Now, Kevin works from Russian to English in the so-called secure market, defense and nuclear disarmament. So you can imagine what might happen if one of his client's texts were mistranslated or misrepresented. So a first tip here, look for risk. If you're aiming for premium markets, seek it out. Uh, Dave, do you have an example of a job where you just didn't care about the cost? Uh, the cost of translation. Yeah. Yeah, um, sure. Um... Uh, I mean, our jobs, um, you know, my, my question isn't, um, uh, isn't an innocent question. Um, are you talking about translation? Because usually for us, we're thinking of translation as part of a bigger picture, um, part of a bigger communications picture. Um, and you get the kind of situation that Kevin Hensel talks about, where what you're doing is managing the downside, managing the risk. You know, if you get this wrong, you could get sued, et cetera. Um, and, and we have cases like that, um, uh, legal cases. Um, you know, but there's also um, a lot of times where we don't care about the cost of translation, not because of downside risk, but more because of upside potential, um, like the ad campaign behind me, some examples of it. I mean, that's an ad campaign we do in French um, and, and getting the taglines right in English. Um, 
honestly, the cost of that translation, even if the translator is paid extremely well, is going to be like a rounding error compared to the cost of the media buy. Uh, so it's really, really, really worth it for us to get the translation right. Um, and so, so, you know, both in terms of managing downside risk and in terms of capturing upside potential in terms of effective foreign language communications, there are lots of times when as a buyer, uh, we don't really care that much about the cost of the translation part, but we just want it to be good. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to bet that you set a very high bar because that's my next point. Um, most premium clients will have dealt with fallout from sloppy yeah. or downright poor translation work delivered in the past. In fact, some despair of ever finding expert translators who can deliver work that can be used straight away. They're resigned to rewriting virtually all of the work that they buy in. Imagine that. But since these buyers, okay, demanding buyers have been burnt once or more, they have no patience with waffle and bloat. They don't go along with the inflated claims that's, that suppliers at the commoditized end of the market will sometimes make when pitching, for example, the marvels of modern technology. I have actually heard and occasionally engaged with uh, tech focused translators who go on and on about translating 10,000 words a day as if that should be the norm and what's wrong with you if you're only translating 1,500 or 2,000. Um, my reaction to that now is get serious. For the type of text we're talking about where nuance is incredibly important and the nature of language means that you have to stop and think and weigh and consider. Uh, well, clients in these kind of areas will want to see your portfolio as a translator who wants to work for them, and they'll generally check your references. Um, you, I think, Dave, had a fail you were going to talk to us about. Yeah, I mean, we have had that sort of thing happen. Um, uh, I mean, exactly the kind of example that you're talking about, where you, you know, kind of once bitten, twice shy, you get burned in the past, um, uh, and it makes you either change your processes or shy away from getting things translated. I mean, those mm -hmm. kind of choices get made too, right? Um, uh, sometimes companies like mine literally give up um, on communicating in certain languages because they can't find people who are specialized enough in the field to do the communications right. And then you can't manage the operational risk. I um, mean, we have had that happen. Um, when I first joined the bank, so coming up on, on, on 20 years ago, um, it was just after we literally had to walk away from the English translation of an issue prospectus. And that was, you know, pretty high stakes thing for us. Uh, the bank was getting recapitalized um, because at the time BCB could not find English translators who could do it right. Um, now, that was a different market. That was 20 years ago. Um, uh, but that was one of the things that drove the decision to rethink our translation processes here. Um, so that we could figure out ways to find people uh, who could do it right and, mm -hmm. and 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 embed them in processes that 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 enabled them, that empowered them to get it done right. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we we have had things like that. Luckily, they're a little fewer and farther between now. Okay, I'm going to come back to the notion of embed in a minute because I the more I have advanced in these particular fields, the more pertinent that seems to me. Um, for people who are attending, um, I also claimed in my blurb, the original blurb about this, this session, that demand for mission critical work that we're talking about here exists in all language combinations. Okay, okay, I know that universal claims in a uh, field as diverse as translation are risky, right? Um, translation covers everything from like cartoon uh, captions to gaming software, to top level diplomacy, to HR litigation with labor unions, to scientific issues. Um, but I must say this notion that demand exists in all language combinations has certainly been my experience in talks I've given and contacts I've had on four continents. Um, that is, I have yet to see a country or language combination where premium translations were not being commissioned. But I have met many genuinely skilled and hardworking translators who were completely unaware of what was going on in the next silo over, right? And maybe that's just a sign that good translators are totally 
involved in their part of the market. Uh, but I think that can work against us if it makes us not see, not realize that there are other potentially more interesting market segments not too far away. This is probably a good place to point out that when you work at the premium end of the market, you will almost always be working into your native language, not the other way around. And you'll be working with a skilled and experienced reviser. Okay, exceptions to the inter into native rule exist, but you should be aware that such basic best practice rules exist for a reason. The reason is that they save time for buyers. And if, as a translator, you want to work into several languages and so on, and you claim that you're an exception, keep in mind that you bend or break the rules at your own risk and peril. Dave? Huh. Um, what can I say to that? Yeah, um, I mean, at BCV, we, we are buyers of, of translation. We are also, in a sense, buyers of translators because <laughs> we, we hire them once in a while. I mean, we have an in-house team here. Uh, that I'm in charge of in addition to buying translation. Um, so, to, so to give one example that kind of speaks to Chris's point, um, when we have people applying for a job, uh, if, if someone in, uh, tells me that they translate, I don't know, into German and into French, that they're bilingual, um, I take that as, I actually take that as a bad sign when I'm looking at the CVs. Like that is definitely not going to get you to the top of the pile. Um, on the contrary, um, you know, kind of jack of all languages, master of one is the first thought that's going to go through my mind in the same way that it would relative to specialization, by the way, you know, jack of all fields, master of none. Um, obviously, we're looking for banking and finance specialists when we hire here, and, um, and particularly when we're looking for freelance partners, because the hope is that that person will be kind of plug and play, um, whereas an in-house person, you could coach a little bit early in their career. Mm -hmm. um, but the native speaker thing, yeah, um, sure. I mean, I agree, Chris, there are exceptions. I mean, in English, Nabokov, Joseph Conrad, very honorable exceptions. They did quite well as English writers having come from other native languages. But when you're looking through a pile of 70 CVs, you just don't have time to look for those people. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so I wouldn't. Um, I'd say that being a native speaker is necessary, not sufficient, but necessary condition. Uh, okay, and uh, thank, thanks. And I would, I would, you know, go further there. I think a lot of the sort of food fights that translators get into about whether or not you'd be a native speaker and so on, I, I don't see that as as time and energy that's usefully employed. If you think you can do it, yeah. do it. Sign your work, show that this is what you do, and then um, see what the market says about you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's just a, a useful way to look at it. Right. But I think people do need to be pretty clear that a guy like me looking through CVs, he's he's going to look for native speakers, period. Okay. Whatever whatever the language. Because is. my translators are going to be in meetings with other native speakers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, I mean, if you walk into a meeting like that, um, mm -hmm. if you're speaking in the other language with an accent, fair or unfair, you've already got a strike against you in terms of convincing the guy across from the table that you're the language person, you're the language expert. Again, fair or unfair, but that's just the way it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, so to sum up, and I'm just looking at my notes here, to get even a peek into the premium door, you also have to have mastered the craft of translation. So this is not just fluency in your source and target languages. It's also through acquisition of the reflexes and the kind of sense of language, of language uh, the way Pinker puts it, that you need to move smoothly and seamlessly from one language to the other. Um, in addition to your reviser, my experience of premium clients is that they'll generally want to work through the text you deliver. Certainly my clients want that. Uh, they'll be asking about your choices and they might be suggesting other options. They will also expect you, that is like me as a provider of translations, to ask questions. They'll welcome my questions. This is partly to do just with the nature of language, where if nuance is important, and it isn't important in some texts, but in premium texts, it generally is. Um, part of the, it, it reflects maybe the, fact, the way texts are written, perhaps in a committee or by people who are dealing with their in-house vocabulary and in-house worldview. Uh, they're not necessarily clear on what 
is understandable to the outside world. So the fact that a translator asks questions is not only expected, it's actually a positive thing. Okay, not stupid questions. If I work in the financial sector and I ask, what is this abbreviation EUR? Uh, no, <laughs> that's, a, that's a stupid question. But for the most part, the nature of language is such that the questions I ask to clarify an area where I've already specialized are pro is probably pretty good. Um, in addition, to your own reviser as a translator, right? Working in the pre premium segment, um, you, you want to plan ahead for the type of questions that will come up in the meetings that you're in, in the exchanges that you're in with clients. Um, I think that the ability to take part in discussions in my client's language is something that is considered normal and important. They expect me to be able to interact with them. Um, Dave, do you have that experience in your meetings with translators? Um, yeah. Um, I mean, first off, uh, completely agree on, 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 on any image critical kind of content. We try to have a meeting with the client that at, at, at BCV that goes all the way up to meetings between the translation team and the CEO and the CFO. I mean, we'll be having them starting next week about our annual results. They're going to be coming out pretty soon. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, in those meetings, it's going to be about asking questions. It's also going to be about providing solutions and options. Mm -hmm. um, so again, kind of speaking to what you just said, like anticipating possible problem areas. And okay, this is the wording that I put in my draft translation. But if they don't like this, here's my plan B, here's my plan C, here's my plan D. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times that happens upstream between a translator and a revisor or even a second revisor. I mean, for our annual report, we'll probably get six eyes on it rather than just four mm -hmm. before we go to the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and once again, I mean, for, for us um, right now in the current configuration of, of our top management at BCV, I'll have German translators walking into a meeting with a na native German speaking CFO. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if that person doesn't like your original wording, you better be really articulate with a bunch of other options. Um, oh, okay, well, we could say it in German this way or this way or this way or this way or this way, or like walking the source sort of thing. So otherwise the CFO is going to be saying, well, wait a minute, they're the language guys. Why do I have to do this? Uh -huh. um, uh, so asking questions, yeah, absolutely. And listening very attentively, trying to, to, to figure out exactly what they want to say, what they don't want to say, what the nuances are. Uh -huh. A lot of times that's happening in the source language, uh -huh. uh, you know, which means that your source language skills do have to be considerable. Um, and then saying, oh, okay, I get you. So we could say this or this or this or this or this. You're the boss, you choose. But I'm the language guy. So I just gave you six possible choices. That's sort of how it works for us, at least on image critical stuff. Those okay. meetings can be kind of stressful, uh, but also quite exciting. Um, and once in a while, pretty fun. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, so the point there is that if you were a, a translator targeting premium segments, you need to train up for that, right? I say oh, yeah, that we debrief, we debrief meetings afterward, Chris. I'll sit down with my team say, and say, how did that go? What did we do right? What did we do wrong? Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I say that knowing that we have students and beginners in the room today, all right? And you're all very welcome. You're most welcome. In fact, young translators are particularly welcome because one of my concerns these days is that earnest and well-meaning teachers often paint an overly bleak picture of the market that some of them say awaits you. Um, the future of translation is post-editing, for example. I mean, in certain segments of the market, to be sure, but not in all, not in all. And in premium markets, uh, definitely not. OK, so you need to know that the high end translation we're discussing this evening exists. You need to know that and you need to know that it is crying out for talent. You need to know that so that you can it'll help you chart your own path towards a career that's satisfying and lucrative and interesting. Right. Um, it's also to help you avoid burnout if you get stuck at the commoditized bulk end of the market, and to encourage you to hone the skills that you're going to need as you move ahead when you ex acquire more experience, okay? Uh, this is, of course, as David implied, assuming you see premium markets as something that is a, a good fit for you, because along with all that adrenaline, there's a certain amount of stress, and I certainly acknowledge that it's not for everybody, okay? Um, Can I just underline something that you just said? 
Sure. Uh, Chris said that the market is crying out for talent. I'd like to underline that three times. Um, we're constantly looking for people who are really good that we can hire mm -hmm. um, constantly. You know, that that combination of really, really good target language skills, like good enough to have been like a newspaper editor back in your target language mm -hmm. zone back home. Um, specialized knowledge of finance, you know, to the kind of insatiable curiosity that we translators tend to have, but you focused it on one field. Um, you know, from my point of view, those people are way too rare. Um, and I'm always looking for them. Um, and that's me in my field. And I think there are a bunch of other people like me in other fields uh, mm -hmm. who, who have the same challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay, then moving right along to my next point, which is specialized, like really, some of you will recognize the, uh, the, the PowerPoint presentation here. That was Dave speaking uh, two years ago, three years ago, um, where he was urging people to get a genuine, real specialization, okay? Um, he couldn't be clearer, but I'll take it one step further. If in my opinion, uh, you should only consider pitching your skills as a premium translator, as a high-end translator, if you've already done a lot of the work to get to that place, right? You shouldn't just decide, okay, I'm going to be a subtitler, I'm going to be a science translator, I'm going to be whatever, and announce that and think you'll learn on the job. You need to invest the time, considerable amount of time and effort up front to be a good ways along the road to, to being that specialized translator before you even begin to look for, for clients, okay? Sometimes I get the impression that there are translators who are largely aspirational, like they, they announce specialties that they would love to have, and then the idea is that they'll learn it along the way. Um, in, my, in my experience, the market does not really um, work that way, okay? Uh, and I just wanted to, you know, raise your uh, your awareness of that. Um, I Chris, think may I, qual may I qualify that very briefly? Sure. Um, so that's Chris's perspective as a freelancer talking about the freelance market, and I agree with it. And I am frustrated mm -hmm. uh, by these people who come in and pitch me and say they're specialized in finance, and the first thing you see from them makes it very clear they're not. Um, on the other hand, a shop like mine will. You know, if we identify someone um, whose target language skills impress us enough, um, uh, we'll, we'll take them under our wing, even if they don't have the specialized knowledge as an intern, as a junior translator, and we'll train them up. Um, and I literally mean under our wing. That is to say, you're not exposed to the market while you're inexperienced, which is smart because it's a small world um, and people will quickly become aware of your inexperience. But when we have a young person here, they can kind of stand behind us. Mm -hmm. um, so we do we do build them up. So that's one possible career arc. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not opposed. It's not a contradiction to what Chris is saying. What Chris is saying mm -hmm. is don't jump in as a freelancer when you don't know what you're doing. And I cannot agree with that enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think the reason I wanted to run this slide past you is simply to point out that the premium market is not obviously not the only market that's, that's there. There's also the bulk market where automation is really great and doing a lot of amazing things, but we're talking about different realities here. Okay. So don't let yourself get over impressed by big numbers, big numbers, big numbers. Okay. Um, keep in mind that what we're talking about with premium translation tends to be deep specialization rather than broad. Okay. Um, the whole point of this session tonight really is to point out well, you know, to point out some of the risks there are, to, to provide some definitions, to give some content uh, ideas from me. I'm a provider of translations and Dave is a buyer of translations, okay? Um, but we do actually want to give you some signposts and some actual concrete information on how to get there from here, all right? Uh, and so here, I'm just gonna go through some points and Dave, you jump in as you, as you like or you know, as appropriate sure. and, um, We'll just see see if we can leave some takeaways for people who are sitting in on this and looking for ways to craft their their journey, their career, so that they can get uh, some in, ins on this type of work. Okay, um, a couple of years ago, I started talking kind of jokingly, actually, about translator land versus uh, client land, and one of the things I was talking about there was the fact that translators tend to stay in their own environment. Um, here, we're just kind of joking still, right? Translators are over there in translator land. To get to, to actually get an idea of the type of work you're going to have to do, 
uh, for genuine premium clients, you have to get out of the house. You have to you know, get brave. And now that COVID is, is past us, pretty much past us for now. Um, and you have to put on your good outfit and go out to where clients hang out. I find far too many translators who, who persist in engaging with other translators on social media and on the rest as if that were the peak of the peak possibility of professional interaction. That's kind of the safe option. It's much easier talking to translators, even if, even if they're a little quirky and sometimes aggressive, than it is to go out and listen to clients and see where their heads are, okay? Um, I think you know, my point here is that social media in translator land is not the place where clients are for the most part. It's client land is someplace else. Um, I mentioned, Dave mentioned embedding and I will mention it here. I'll refer here to the Turing test and let you guys look that up if you, if you, if you want to. But the point uh, for me is that if you're going to be working and producing really, really good work for a client, it seems impossible for me to do that unless you actually know who the client is, unless you spent time with internet searches or with interaction with a client to know exactly what their language is about, exactly what their priority is about, exactly what their, their field is and the, the major issues they've got, what their language is. Um, Dave, I, I gave a, a class for your students um, last a, a while ago. And it was interesting to me, even with your really good students, the exercise I gave them was really tough because they were not familiar with the company whose work we were we were translating, and so they were by definition even even with doing you know, serious work on the on the client right they they still weren't on the inside yet. So my advice here is to embed with good potential clients right, and um, by possibly by identifying client watering holes and and client events where they will go. You don't even have to talk to start out with. Just go along and listen to the way they carry on. And then engage. Little by little, you engage. Okay? Chris, maybe I'll jump in here about your yep. first two points. Um, mm -hmm. Right? So, uh, Chris's point about, you know, the, the, the world of translators as opposed to kind of business person world um, uh, and the idea of embedding. Um, I mean, th those two ideas inform one of the process decisions we made here about 15 years ago relative to the external translators we contract with to provide services to us. Um, we do buy translations from people who are far flung, um, who, who we really like and we know for various reasons we cannot bring here to Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, but when it is possible, um, we work with freelancers who can actually come here in the offices of BCV's communications department physically. Um, uh, and, you know, the, 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 the reasons behind that relate to Chris's first two points, right? Um, it, put this, it puts the translator smack in the middle of, of an entire communications team, a team of people who, you know, a lot of whom don't think too much about translation, which mm -hmm. most people in communications don't. Um, uh, and of course it embeds them. Um, so they become more familiar with the company, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's one of our basic process moves. And of course mm -hmm. it makes things more complicated for us and it makes things cost more for us. Um, but we think we get a payoff in terms of what comes out the other end in terms of, of multilingual communication that's more effective. Yeah. I was noticing just the other day that when I'm working with a client, I tend to move pretty quickly from you could do this or you could do that to we so can we, do this. Yeah. We can do this and we can do that. I'm an outside supplier, right? But it's it's a mindset thing where you're actually into the I am part of the team. And um, I think it's an important, it's an important leap to make, actually, right? Yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, relating to that um, in an unfortunate sort of way, when you hear a member of an in-house translation team, you know, an international organization or a company or whatever, talk about their organization as they yeah bad sign, uh, which bad I, sign. It, it, it's it's the it's it's the 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 hallmark sign of a translation team that is marginalized that they're, they're actually an external team already they just don't know it yet <laughs> right okay um without wanting to sound like a ranter um i will emphasize this point three which i'm increasingly uh, mm -hmm. focused on okay uh you know translation is not easy and finding good clients premium clients is not just a question of saying i do premium work 
It's actually going out there and doing the work, okay? Um, when I have been in different countries, especially, I, I'm, I'm particularly interested in Eastern Europe right now, but I've been in, uh, found myself in countries where people say, oh, well, you know, you talk about premium markets, that you're, you work into English and you're in France, and so, of course, there's work. Um, I, one of my reactions nowadays, and I, I'm a very nice person, <laughs> so I don't criticize and get angry at people, but I do a little lightning round of questions the, the aim being to point out to people that there's stuff they could be doing to discover premium clients that they're not doing. My little lightning round of questions is something like, can you identify the top five industries or companies in your country or your region or your city? Uh, is there a stock exchange? Is it open every day? What are the top five capitalizations? Um, what, are you, what are the leading world-class scientists and technologies in your country or your region or your city? And what are the current, or what's the current urban infrastructure? That's an, an area where there's a lot of translation going on. Um, and what are the investment priorities in your city or your region or your country? What are the upcoming EU uh, directives that are going to affect the business people in your, in your country? I say all that and I kind of rattle it off. And most of the time, the translators I'm talking to are kind of like, ah, because they don't look at things like that. This is, goes beyond just being aware of current events. It means digging in and learning about how the economy in your country is structured, even if you're not going to translate uh, financial texts, because uh, one of the things for sure is that, you know, I, as, a, as a, just a rule of thumb, follow the money. Uh, there are a lot of these, these um, priorities or, or sources of funds that will finance cultural projects that will finance research, that will finance lots of other things. And if you are not aware of what they are, you're missing out, you're missing out. And that is the type of work and research that you actually can, and in my opinion, should do if you're looking for premium clients. Chris, may I come at that point, um, sure. your, your third point from a slightly different direction? Mm -hmm. um, I, I agree with what Chris said, but I, I, um, I, th I think um, we, can, we can also see another dimension of it. Um, you know, Chris was talking about translator land two points ago, you know, the kinds of things that, that we translators um, uh, talk about with each other at conferences. Um, one thing that, that has come up a lot, um, I've heard several times at different conferences, it's like, well, you know, um, uh, we translators, our level of training uh, in terms of the number of university degrees we typically have, et cetera, the level of intellectual engagement um, that that's sort of requisite to be able to do our job. It's it's really similar to being a lawyer, and yet we don't have the job prestige that lawyers have. Um, I think a lot of us have heard some some sort of variation on that. Um, yeah, and it's not fair, right? And it's not fair, <laughs> sir. sir, sir. Um, uh, you know, w w w which is probably true. Um, then again, there's you know a ton of things out there that aren't fair. But I guess what I would say to it is, okay, fair enough, but. Um, uh, a 27-year-old who's trying to make partner at her law firm is pulling 90-hour weeks, right? Um, so when Chris is, says in her point, do the work, that's what I'm thinking about as well. Um, I came up with no background in finance, none. I studied 18th century British philosophy and literature. Um, so I pulled my 90-hour weeks to get up to speed in my field. Um, and, and it's worth it because it makes it so much more fun. I mean, in addition to increasing your earnings power and pricing power or pricing power, if you're a freelancer, um, it also just makes the work so much more fun, but you've got to do it. Um, and you can't really make that comparison against the lawyers and say life is unfair unless you've, you've also put in that kind of work, um, not just in your specialization. That's the example I gave, but in your target language writing skills, the, the whole nine yards, your source language, if you need to improve it. Um, that that's part of it too. That really is part of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I referred to this earlier. Specialized, like really. That's quoting Dave. Um, point I want to make here is that advertising yourself as a technical translator is far too general. All right. Even advertising yourself as a financial translator or a medical translator or a legal translator is often far too general. It's only once you've achieved a certain uh, genuine specialization uh, that you realize how 
many subsectors there are and specialty subspecialties there are. Um, and I think that that's that's the kind of thing you really have to be clear on. I see translators nowadays, actually quite a few, who who advertise themselves as specialized in marketing. And I'm not really sure what that means, right? Um, does it mean I like to do creative texts? Okay, well, then maybe you should talk more about that. Or does it mean I've heard that this pays better than general purpose text? I'm just not sure about that. And I think translators in, in describing exactly what they do are not always very clear. When I meet a new client who might be a good match for me, if we're talking about the same fields, I know enough to throw a few keywords into our discussion so that person will recognize me as part of their tribe or potential part of their tribe, okay? I'm coming back again and again to that. All right. Um, my point number five, who is it for, is a reference to the importance of a brief. I consider that, I, re I mean, I really like my clients. I've worked for many of them for a number of years. I've got some new ones over the lockdowns and so on. Um, but I know that even with good clients, and I make a point of having good clients, right? Uh, they don't think about translation all the time, right? So when they call you to ask you to translate something, they will not necessarily have prepared a brief for you. And so it is your role, it's my role, to ask tactful, pleasant, insightful questions to figure out who this text is for, right? Most of the time, these good clients really appreciate that and they recognize the importance of that, even if they didn't think about it um, up front. Okay, so I think you need to practice asking the type of questions you need to get a, a serious brief. And if you have clients who are saying, I don't have time to give you a brief, that is probably not a good client. I'm just taking a wild guess there, okay? Point number six for me is how big is the pie? I think, you know, of all the questions I've been asked over my, you know, 99 years as a translator, uh, the most common question is how much should I charge? And if it's in a public auditorium, sometimes people are a little shy, but they'll get, come back to you afterwards and say, oh, I've got this potential job and how much should I charge, right? Um, somehow I think that people like that want someone else to take the responsibility for saying, oh, charge this, <laughs> which is virtually impossible because I don't know your clients. And mm -hmm. unless you know the, the context in which uh, something is going on. What I do know is that most translators who see themselves as potentially premium clients have no idea what pricing is. Um, as long as you're doing this sort of basic thing, which is what are my expenses? How many words can I produce? Oh, that will give me my price per word. You've kind of missed the boat as far as I'm concerned. What I wanna know when, I'm, when a client contacts me or when I'm working on a project is what is the main, what is the overall budget? How much are they spending on this? Because that allows me then to position myself to get what I consider to be a good part of the pie uh, for me. Is, am I a money grubber? No, not necessarily. But I think there is such a thing as, as disqualifying yourself for premium markets by bidding too low. And this refers back to the sort of silo structure where translators imagine that what they know of the translation market now is what it is everywhere. And I would definitely say that most of the time, uh, translators do not know. They do not know much about pricing. And discomfort with money issues, discomfort with talking about money is truly the soft underbelly of our uh, profession, all right? Um, another thing, and this is possibly related to this, I know I have uh, many good friends who are academics and I've had ongoing discussions with them. And I have noticed that in lots of, on lots of courses, um, the humanities orientation of many translation courses is that business is bad, culture is good, uh, if you do, if you translate business texts, well, you got to do it because you got to earn some money, but ew, it's kind of dirty and so on. Um, I would urge you to reconsider that because for me, if you're going to be working in any field, you should manage to, for, at least for the length of the, the job you're doing, feel pretty enthusiastic about the work you're doing for that client because you can be sure that premium clients are downright enthusiastic about their work. They're excited about it. And if you constantly you know, carry on as if uh, I am dirtying my hands working on this this business text or corporate strategy text or this money related topic uh, that that seeps through that comes through clients feel it and you you lose support you will not get very far with that I don't know if you've noticed that Dave I have it's just um, 
yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm sitting on on, on pretty firmly on one side of that. Um, uh, I've, I, I've, I guess the the most interesting thing I, I, I could say to that, that that I can speak to about that is um, this article uh, written by um, a professor, I think, uh, uh, in Limerick in Ireland. Her name is Helen Kelly Holmes, and she um, she did a study of um, how um, uh, MBA courses described translation, how translation and multilingual communication is described in MBA courses. So I'm going to I'm going I'm to flip what you're saying on its head here, Chris, but this is a little mm -hmm. interesting. Please. Um, that, that, and, 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 and what she discerned was was a, a kind of anti-translator and translation bias among business people. Um, translation was almost invariably described among business people and MBA uh, uh, course material as a source of expense and operational risk, as opposed to a potential driver of profits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it cuts both ways. Um, that that said, I mean, what what I would say to that is that the, the, unfortunately, that reputation is a tiny little bit deserved because translators dabble in fields they don't know well enough, and they make mistakes, and which is what we in business call operational risk, and things get screwed up. Um, so so it, it it does cut a little bit both ways, and so I think maybe both sides need to take a couple steps in each other's direction. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and um, the other thing I would say to that is that um, um, in uh, certain premium market business environments, one thing that's really neat is that you have the necessary resources there to be able to do really, really, really good work. You know, you get that extra level of revision on it, et cetera, that, that in, a, in, 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 in some more quote unquote cultural settings, because they don't have the resources, you kind of get one translator working alone, um, as opposed to three translators brainstorming and being able to dialogue with the author, all those things yeah. being equal, this process is going to be better than this one. Yeah. It just will. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, so, if, so, if, so it's true. I mean, if you do have a kind of reflexive anti-business bias, that, that means you're also shutting yourself out of some processes where you can do some really, really good, really, really satisfying work with other translators who you'll find inspiring and challenging and need to work with. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm almost to the end of my little list of tips here. Um, but I think in a, in a general way, and I, this is truly important, empathy and generosity are vital. Uh, I know there's in translator land, there's lots of talk about, oh, do you do free tests or no? Well, I just, oh, we, I'm not going to do a free test. My time is important and so on. Um, I have found very often, and partly due to the you know, historical issues where good clients have been burned by translators who are not very good, that offering, if my negotiations with a new client are kind of like sort of stopping, we're not making any decisions here, um, offering to do a free segment of a text of theirs just so they can see what it would look like, right? That often will shake things up enough and allow us to move ahead. That's a kind of generosity with my time, which is, of course, you know, interested in my in my outcome which is to get the get the work of course um but i think i think too this the idea of having a lot of time and and being willing to dedicate extra your extra energy and your extra time to making sure the project works for your client um is is very important clients react the clients i'd like to work with react extremely um positively to that so you know this notion of a free trial offer for a segment of a text is a very, very effective um, way to, to get introduced uh, to a market where the clients are kind of worried about what they're gonna get, in fact, okay? Um, and then next to last, I would say it's a marathon, not a sprint. Like uh, I understand that in, you know, in your career, there are times when you can't work full time because you got small children or you're taking care of your parents or something. But I genuinely see the profession, translation, as something which is a long-term commitment, okay? And so part of that long-term commitment is ongoing, um, continuing professional development. And even at my advanced age, I, I regularly take classes um, to hone this or that side of my skills or just revisit some skills that I wanna see. Partly because one, of, I, one thing I found is that the very best place, one of the best places to meet premium clients is when you're taking a course alongside them. And the type of courses that I take now very often have me sitting next to potential clients. And the interaction that goes on there is um, is really quite, 
quite positive. So investing in yourself through ongoing uh, training is uh, super important, super important. Okay. Um, I'm, I've included here a couple of, um, of references that I think would be useful for anybody who wants to go any further in here. Uh, if you're watching the recording of this, you can either click through or, or, or contact me if one of the references is not clear to you. But I think all of that will, is part of the doing the work to find out more about how premium markets um, operate. Uh, that, would, that will pay off. That will definitely, definitely pay off. Okay. Um, and I wanted to then move on to um, Q&A. Uh, Marina, are you still with us? Would you like to um, pull up some questions for us? Yes, there are quite a few questions. Um, we have a lot of thank you, thank yous uh, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, but uh, to get to the questions, um, let me start with this one. It's about uh, specialization. Okay. We have a question and then two comments to that question. So um, I, uh, I'm curious to see uh, uh, what you think um, uh, about the, the reactions. Does specializing mean then to get a degree in a specific area and then to work several years on it before you can claim you're a specialist? And um, this is a question from Manuel. And the, we have two replies. One is knowledge is much more than a degree. You have to know stuff as if you actually work as a manager or a specialist in that field. Mm -hmm. And the second comment is, I took my exams as a science translator more than 30 years ago, but only then the actual specializing started. Mm -hmm. And even within a domain, in this case, medicine, there are subfields to specialize in. Okay, well, you know, I will react to this by immediately, Dave, I'm, you can jump in if you want to, but uh, by saying that, you know, regardless of what you studied initially, we have this amazing thing called the internet, which allows us to uh, take courses, to tune into, I mean, during the COVID um, lockdowns and so on, I can't count the number of roundtables that I tuned into in the in fields that interest my clients, where I could ask questions and and learn more and and discover works that I had to read to understand why clients in my sectors were talking the way they were talking. Uh, again, it's a question of doing doing the work, right? Um, I guess my main point there is that you can't just announce that you're specialized now as of today. <laughs> Go out and uh, imagine that you will be able to um, to, to get, get specialized work. It doesn't it doesn't work that way. I can I can recall you know people who would say, oh, I'll buy like a bilingual dictionary or something. Uh uh, that's not the level of specialization we're talking about. And again, it's not just finance or business. It's virtually every field. Um, I don't know, like next week, I'm doing a, a, a two, a four hour course in how to break into the events management um, field, because I'm translating something for an events management company. And it's useful for me to just hear English language specialists talking about it. It's, it's not targeting translators, huh? but it's just something that's useful for me to know. Uh, Dave, do you have any points there? Um, well, yeah, I mean, it, people are sort of asking for metrics, um, you know, because it's true, you know, you're sitting there saying, well, can I consider myself to be specialized? So I guess, I mean, the first one is, is what you just said, you know, s s saying saying it doesn't make it so. Um, I mean, there are some metrics out there. Chris, you published one years ago, you know, saying you're, you're not you're not you're not really a specialist in the field until you've accumulated a number of years working mm -hmm. full time in that field. Mm -hmm. uh, when you unpack that, there are a couple things a lot of us translators aren't going to like, uh, like the fact that, you know, you pay a penalty for working part time, mm -hmm. keeping in mind that over half of all translators work part time. And it's true. I mean, you know, it's you get your practice time in and it takes twice as long if you're working half time. You might not like it, but it's just true. Um, a guy named Fane Hermanson, who's a translator at Google, said that, you know, at Google, when they're looking for specialized translators, they're looking for people who understand the entire landscape in which a given bit of text fits. Um, and he gave the example of someone translating like long tail advertising into German or Norwegian or something like that. And it came out as advertisers with long tails, like some sort of new um, <laughs> biological species. 
Um, Kevin Hensel, uh, the former ATA spokesman, uh, said that one way you can become specialized is working for several years and an expert in the field. Chris alluded to Kevin at the beginning of her talk. You know, he's the guy that does the kind of sci-tech nuclear industry translation. So he worked with scientists for years. So you're maybe not working with another reviser in your target language, but you may be working with a source language person, but who knows the target language well enough to correct you when you're wrong on a matter of fact in your field. Um, in my world, the, the metric I came up with for it, the one that works functionally for us here, is when you walk into that meeting as, say, a German translator, as a French to German translator, when we speak French here, you see we're translating into German and English, and you're sitting across the table from the CFO, who is a native speaker of German, can you be a solution provider? I mean, are you more articulate than she is? because she's being paid to run the bank's finances. You're being paid to be the word guy. So you've got to come up with five different ways mm -hmm. of spinning the phrase faster than she does in that field, field specific. Doesn't mean you know the field as well as she does, but it means you know it awfully well. In addition, of course, to being a native speaker. Um, so, so that's more of a functional one. You know, do, do, do you feel almost like you could write the source text yourself for some of this stuff? Mm -hmm. um, rather than a quantitative one, more of a subjective qualitative one. So I think there are a few metrics out there that if you know you want to be really honest with yourself and clear eyed, you know, am I specialized enough in the field? You can ask yourself those four questions. Chris's, Svein Hermanson, Kevin Hensel's or mine. They have a pretty good idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thanks. Marina, anything else? Yes, one um Perhaps they will take this one first because uh, it's right up the his alley. It's about banking, and uh, someone uh, is writing. Banking is the sector that I'm most interested in. What therefore should be my first step? Should I apply for some entry level job, or perhaps focus solely on my studies? There was a comment to this. Um, I'm wondering if you agree. Try joining a bank with the translation department. I started at a French bank 30 years ago, fresh out of university. I was in at the deep end, but learned so much interacting with the analysts. Then I went freelance. Yeah, that, that is a great way to start, right? Um, uh, a lot of us started that way uh, by joining an in-house team. Um, as a matter of fact, Chris, I think both of us started that way, right? Although you yeah. were more brokerage, were you not? Yeah. Um, uh, and, and then you can train up under the senior translator, translators in your target language and really get good, um, fast. Um, and take night uh, courses. I mean, in France, the yeah, but, but there banking are other, association offers courses. So you there are other ways and... to go about it. There really are other ways to go about it. I mean, I think we translators in general tend to be really curious people, right? I mean, that's the cool thing about translators, like everything interests us. Um, so you just throw yourself in it. Like Chris said, the internet is out there, everything is out there and you, you can read up that way. Um, what, what I would say is, I mean, acquiring experience as an, as, as an expert in the field, working in the field, is another way to become a, a, a banking and finance translator. I mean, a very well-known colleague of ours who works into French, Dominique Yonkers, was a corporate banker mm -hmm. in Belgium before he became a translator. And that's a wonderful way to do it. Mm -hmm. So there are a bunch of different ways to go about it. Um, I, I guess one thing you might want to keep in mind is um, uh, if you want to acquire that experience, you'd probably do better to acquire it in the target language zone. Many of us translators are people who have moved to the source language area, an American who moved to Switzerland. Um, uh, you know, but if, if you go to work, you know, as, as I don't know, a branch manager in a, in a French speaking bank, speaking French, that actually might mess you up as a French to English translator. <laughs> uh, you'd be better off going back to Kansas and working in a bank there. And then you, and then you come back, which logistically can be real complicated. Uh, you know, but 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 you do have to keep in mind that it's the target language that counts at the end of the day. Um, you know, that and 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 at least in banking, I mean, it's not just you know replacing words with other words. I mean, you go at things really differently. Um, Anglo banks lead with the net profit and the earnings per share, whereas French banks start at the top line and work their way down. You wouldn't even know that, you know, unless you have that target language exposure. 
So, so that would be one piece of advice I would give to this person who's saying, oh, should I go and try and get some training? That would be wonderful if you can, you know, but if you can go back to your target language zone to get that training in the field, because then it'll really pay off. Yeah, yeah. I know, you know, we, we are, because of your type of work and mine, we, we tend to talk about business and finance and banking, but I think that applies to every field that you work in or that you might want to work in. Um, I know one of, one of my clients sponsors a, a boat in the Vendee Globe um, around the world boat race. And uh, since I don't do sailing, I have occasionally, you know, referred to, to translator colleagues who specialize in sailing. And it's, in it's interesting to see the number of them who actually sail and take sailing courses and sign up for sailing courses and read all the time about, you know, sailing magazines. That's one way to specialization as well, right? I think um, you want to keep keep the the notion of what exactly is a specialization uh, clearly in mind, and that there are many like sort of nano specializations that are quite attractive. In fact, yeah, maybe another thing I'd want to say to that, keeping in mind my own dear students uh, at the University of Geneva, um, and 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 students everywhere who who you know at the very beginning of their career who have no idea what field or fields interest them, mm -hmm. are saying, well, wow, that's a tough choice to have to make right now and you don't you know i mean at the beginning of the field especially if you can take internships in a couple different fields you can try a few fields out and you should not feel guilty about that i mean try a few things out um uh just yeah. you know, avoid the error that chris says of proclaiming yourself to be a specialist in one area when you're not yeah. um, uh, and then see what works for you at the beginning of my career given my training i would not have imagined myself enjoying finance it wasn't at the top of my list of things to try out uh, but I tried out a few things, and that was the one that really stuck for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, another question, Maria, Marina. Uh, yes, uh, this one, Chris, perhaps more for you. It's a question from Esther. Uh, she did a master's in audio, audio visual translation and just started working freelance. Since mm -hmm. she works from home, she finds it difficult to engage with the market and with new clients. And she would like to know some tips on how to get herself out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think one th th that's totally related to the, um, to the get out of translator land and get out of the house <laughs> argument, which I've made before. Um, you know, there are actually trade fairs for uh, companies that deal with subtitled products. Okay. Um, and I think it's worth you know, putting some money aside, saving some money so that you can actually get out to some of these professional events where that are not for translators necessarily, uh, but where you have a lot of specialists from the field where you can go along and there's usually an exhibit area where you can see companies doing different things, but there are often talks and, and, and you can find them online as well, huh? Uh, so that you understand the strategy that, that is applied in some of these areas. Um, I know that uh, there are a lot of students in particular who are who apparently are really excited about doing subtitling and I get it that it's a sexy topic, right? Um, you need to know more than just the technical part of how to put subtitles in, <laughs> into the screens. You actually have to have a huge, vast cultural knowledge. You have to have a certain amount of experience, right? Um, you have to be able to write well. I was, I was astonished to see somebody who had just, you know, just barely learned, taken a six week course and to learn to, to subtitle and be, within six months was teaching other people how to subtitle. I don't think that's particularly sustainable because I, I do believe in the fact that over time you get better at what you do. And when you start out, good for you for starting out, right? Um, but after two, three years, you're gonna be a whole lot better. So maybe you should hold back on teaching other people how to do something that you haven't quite mastered yourself yet. That's just a reflex that I had. The person's going to have to decide, you know, is, is, is if I remember the question correctly, it's I work from I, I work from home, so I can't do mm -hmm. these things. Um, I, I mean, you might have to make a tough choice there. Um, uh, that, that is to say, if you are going to continue to work only from home, you are going to be closing some doors for yourself. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're going to have to get out like, like Chris advised and go to a trade fair, um, or arrange client meetings, face-to-face -face client meetings, 
um, or the first step to that. It's, you know, if you're saying, well, wait a minute, what are you, you're telling me to arrange client meetings. I don't have any clients yet. Um, well, okay. Um, then you're going to have to go to a translation conference. And that means you're going to have to pony up, right? I mean, I don't know, it costs 600 euros to go to UATF. Um, uh, Madam would be less money, but whatever, you're going to, you're going to have to do it. You're going to have to make that choice. And then you meet some translators um, and then maybe someone offers you collaboration and then you meet a client, mm -hmm. um, you know, but, but the, you know, it's, it, it's kind of the sowing comes first and the reaping comes later. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and, and I think people, people need to realize that, that it's not, um, uh, it's, it's not always, unfortunately, just going to, going to come to you because you're a really good writer and translator. Mm -hmm. um, you, might, you might have to engage in some business practice, which might be more or less compatible um, with your family constraints and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you're going to have to try and find a way to make those things work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the idea is going forward, you know, with each, um, with each experience of that sort, you're not just aiming for one client, right? You're aiming to get a broader understanding of the field that you want to specialize in. And if I look at it now, for me, for example, each new client, it's not just for one job. Normally I would count on, new clients, you know, since I vet them and they vet me, it's usually like good for four or five years worth of work, you know, maybe even more than that. So again, as I say, it's a marathon, not a sprint. You're, you're engaging, you know, you're investing in yourself, you're investing your time or your money or something. And, and then um, the, the aim is to have like a, a broader base from which to tackle the market. So we're approaching the end of our session. So perhaps we take one or two more questions. Mm -hmm. One is about industry pricing. It's a question from someone who is new in the industry mm -hmm. and uh, is asking what is a good way to understand industry pricing conventions when you don't already have contacts? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm the first person to jump out there and say translators are clueless on pricing. Translators systematically underprice themselves. They worry about pricing because it's it's somehow filthy lucre and unpleasant to talk about money. And we don't want to talk about money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So translators then very often will set their prices based on what prices they have been offered by um, translation intermediaries, agencies, and so on. Um, my personal conviction and experience is that most of those agency prices are far lower, far lower than what the prices that would apply to premium work. Um, and it's partly because of the structure of the, you know, the, the market and the translation agencies, which are basically dealing in bulk for the most part. Huh? And they have overheads that you don't necessarily have. Um, I'm, I'm always surprised, too, to see translators who will price themselves a little bit lower than the, what they perceive as agency prices, which is nuts, which is crazy. Why would you do that? I mean, if, if your work is good and you've got a revisor and you're specialized, you should be pricing yourself higher, right? Um, various translator associations publish information about pricing. Um, usually these are surveys. I would say, again, most of those prices tend to be lower than the potential prices you could charge, um, quite simply because the people who answer the surveys are people who very often are unhappy about the prices that they're getting, right? Um, but that's, that's a place to start. Um, there are certain online sources that are, I think, not particularly reliable, but I mean, again, people who announce their prices online in translator land, uh, for me, are very often the ones who are in silos. I've, I've got into ridiculous conversations where people will tell me that the price in for French to English translation, financial translation is such and such. I know for a fact that is not true. I know it is not true, right? Um, if you ask me online and then you get mad at me because I haven't told you what my prices are, uh, well, I don't know. It's just I don't think that's how prices are necessarily discussed in a, in a useful way. That's another reason to join a professional association, because what you will get in person to person discussions is much more useful uh, than what you can see happening out there on the Internet and the wild um, far west of the Internet. They. Yeah. Maybe I can speak to one aspect of that. Um, uh, Chris said, and, and it's true, I mean, if you go online to translators associations, ASCII here in Switzerland or SFT in France, 
interestingly, not in the U.S., right? Because it was a whole antitrust thing. And so now if they say, you know, one word about pricing, they get sued by the DOJ. Um, but anyway, a lot of translator associations will post recommended per word or per hour rates or per whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it is true that when we buy translations here at BC, we, we systematically pay far more, a multiple, a multiple of those rates, mm -hmm. uh, because otherwise the work isn't good enough. Um, uh, and, and so, so, you know, we, we, we need to put our money where our multilingual mouth is, you know, if, if, yeah. if multilingual come to be, to be any good. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, so at least I'm one buyer, I mean, who knows, maybe we're horribly naive here at BC, but I don't think so, because I have colleagues who pay the same rates at other banks, um, and organizations around here. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and am I going to tell you what I pay? No. Will anyone tell you what they pay, um, in those markets? No. Um, uh, should you be surprised by that? No, because it's true in every other market. Um, uh, you know, the premium market segments, uh, it, it, it does tend to be, you know, kind of, kind of person to person relationships and people aren't necessarily going to advertise their rates. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I think Chris is right. If you're very, very good, you might have more pricing power, a lot more pricing power than you think. Yeah, I think, I think also that, um, the, this notion of, you know, what can I charge? I, I gave a talk in the Netherlands last year where, you know, everybody was talking about, you want to get it fair, fair pricing. I would never use fair as a way of pitching my services. I'm charging a fair price. No, are you kidding me? That's crazy. I mean, I don't want to uh, sound arrogant and like I'm exploiting clients, but fair doesn't come into it. No, I charge, I try to figure out what the price is and then I charge a bit more, right? Um, but But I think that, the useful thing there, a useful thing there would be for translators to get out of translator land and take some real negotiating courses and look into value pricing as opposed to cost pricing, um, because that will already give you an idea of how to guide the conversation, you know, conversation with a new client where we start out by talking about, can you do the work? Yes, I've worked in that field. And then I throw in my keywords to show that I know what they're talking about. And then we talk back and forth about the deadline. And we, and we reach the point where they say, okay, so the remaining question is how much will it cost? And in that case, I have to have something I can say. I can't start saying, well, you know, it depends. <laughs> I have to be able to give them a ballpark figure. Okay. And there are certain ways that you can do that. And if you have taken negotiation courses, not with translators, but with, with real business negotiators, you'll be able to do that much better. And as I've said before, Dave, you know this, the, you know, when I, if I, if I finally, I say my price, the correct answer from the client is not, okay, that's the price was too low, right? There should be an intake, rapid intake of breath, right? and some pain felt on the part of the client. And then they say, oh, wow, that's expensive. Well, okay, that is the correct answer. That's the correct answer. And I, yeah, Mike exactly. And I mean, as a buyer, I'm, I mean, listening to you now, like everything you're saying is kind of vaguely unpleasant to me. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and, you know, but but that, that's how it goes. Yeah. yeah. And then that's how it should go. I mean, that's, it's right and proper. That's a business relationship, you know? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's so it's not in an exploitative way, but it's, a, you know, an empathetic way. And yeah. and there, I think translators almost always, because of discomfort with pricing, undersell themselves. It's, just, it's remarkable for me, the extent to which translators undersell their, their, their skills. Uh, and again, it's only when you have the big picture and the cost of the project. And I mean, that's another whole different talk. We could do that next year, Marina. <laughs> Let's do this, that next year. Um, we have, unfortunately, yeah, we, well, we have to go to our last question because we're at the end of our session. But I think it will be interesting for both of you, actually. Uh, and uh, the question was, do you recommend approaching potential clients um, as a translator team, as a duo or as a trio? And there were a couple of comments after which uh, say that there are a lot of advantages to that. Uh -huh. So for the last question, I'm interested uh, in your opinions on this. Yeah, I think very, very definitely. It's added value that I can bring to the table because I have a revisor or you know I work with, with someone else. Uh, when you're a good translator, you get really into your text and sometimes you don't see what's on the page anymore. You see what's in your head. 
And the point of a reviser is someone who comes in with a new set of eyeballs and looks at it and reacts to not just the meaning, but also to stylistic issues and so on. Um, and I, when I say reviser, it's not just, you know, like your spouse or your mom or somebody. It's someone who actually is a, an equally skilled professional. That's really important. Um, and when you bring that to the table, you're bringing something definitely a definite plus with you. Do you agree, Dave? Uh, yeah, completely. Um, first off, I mean, internally here, uh, our, our go-to process, I mean, like 90% of our content uh, is looked at by a second person, um, at least here in Switzerland and in German and in French, they have this expression, you know, the four eyes principle, it's been adopted. Um, I mean, it's not really, it doesn't really exist in English, but a lot of English translators use it because uh, uh, it maps an idea that's just smart, right? Get a second pair of eyes on that. Um, uh, so, you know, so internally, uh, we do that on, on everything except content that we really don't care that much about. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, you know, so when, when someone's coming to pitch me, uh, as, as a possible external freelance service provider, if that person says I work with someone else, then yeah, I mean, it's, it, that speaks to me. I'm like, okay, you know, you've, you've gotten, you know, you've, you've learned lesson of like business processes 101 for translation, you know, get, getting the translation right. It also enriches your professional career enormously mm -hmm. to be able to go back and forth with somebody else uh, mm -hmm. or even a couple of different people. So, so, so if Marina, your question, the question you got was, should, should we work as a duo or a trio rather than working alone? Oh yeah, totally, totally. You know, all those things being equal, it's so much better both in terms of the, the product you'll deliver, all other things being equal, and also just in terms of how fulfilling you'll find the professional arc of your career. If the question was, is it better to work alone as a twosome or as a threesome? I, I do not have an opinion on the twosome versus threesome thing. <laughs> I haven't thought about it enough. Thank you very much, both of you. Unfortunately, we're at the end of our session. I just want to read, it's not a question, but... Uh, maybe to end on a high note. Um, well, one of the, uh, someone says that um, she doesn't have a question as such, but uh, it's a difficult market and she just asks for some encouragement. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so thank you very much to both of you for joining us in TIFF. Really hope to see you again next year. Um, and of course, this presentation will be available uh, to everyone to see again. But thank you again for the presentation, Chris and Dave, and uh, all the best. And my pleasure. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thanks a lot.